Good evening. This is the July 23rd, 2012 meetup of the Constitution, Austin Constitution Meetup Group. I'm John Rowland. And this evening we're going to be having several things to discuss. Uh, I'm going to start out with the topic that was contained in an email I sent out to this group today entitled, Is the Constitution Fit for Americans? A um, little bit of background on this email. I've been uh, engaged over the years in different discussions and debates with a lot of people uh, in the legal profession, in government, and other walks of life. Most of them are about whether to comply strictly with the Constitution as originally understood, or to comply with court precedents even when they depart from the Constitution as originally understood, or to just disregard the Constitution altogether. Now, very few people will admit to that third position. However, a lot of them are actually doing it. And uh, the argument has a way of coming down to that well, even now, most of the people in the third group, the so-called living constitutionalists, admit that their position is not consistent with the Constitution as originally meant and understood. But they claim that uh, st such strict compliance is impractical, that the modern world has demands uh, that cannot be met by strict compliance with the Constitution. And it's, since it's too difficult to amend the Constitution, uh, the best solution is to just pass legislation and let the courts roll over because there cannot possibly hear cases on all the legislation. Congress typically passes every year, even in today's uh, situation of uh, uh, gridlock, about 20,000 separate provisions that I would consider unconstitutional. The courts, taken together, can only hear a small fraction of those. And the Supreme Court, this past year, only heard 65 cases out of the 8,000 that were submitted to it. And most courts are not going to uh, go out on a limb. If they see a statute, they're going to try to find a way, in general, to uphold it and uh, push off the issue to the Supreme Court to try to overturn things. So we have a bottleneck in the courts, and the courts are also pushing back. Uh, as I said in commentary on uh, Justice Roberts' opinion in the healthcare case, and if I be the Sibelius, what he seems to be saying is push back against the people and the political branches. Stop sending all your issues to the courts. You should be settling them in Congress, in the presidency, in elections. That's the place to decide, decide these issues. That's the place to uh, make constitutional determinations. And if you're not going to do it, we can't handle them all. Don't expect us to do it. We just don't have the political clout uh, that we need, would need in order to sustain uh, this ons against this onslaught. So, anyway, we are now stuck with the rather strange opinions in NFIB v. Sibelius. We had four justices on one side. Four on the other, Justice Roberts took a position that sided with one group, the liberals, on the subject of keeping 
the Health Care Act in place, but sided with the conservatives that there was no uh, mandate to buy insurance because it was not authorized under the Commerce and Necessary and Proper Clause. He decided instead to try to defer to Congress by declaring that what they call a penalty is actually a tax. And thereby, and, and also made the ex extraordinarily wrong uh, statement, conclusion, that it is not a uh, direct tax, would be, which would be subject to an apportionment, but is an indirect tax, with, on, with no basis for it whatsoever. In fact, what it is, is a wholly new kind of tax that we've never seen before in American law, a tax on not doing something. Which means he has now created a precedent that uh, Congress may tax you on, let's say, not parting your hair on the left and imposing a one million dollar tax on parting your hair anywhere else. Well, needless to say, that would probably induce people to part their hair on the left. But what about a uh, similar tax on uh, not uh, spending your entire life balancing on one leg and trapping your top of your head? Well, you could do that for a while, but after a while you wouldn't be able to do it anymore. Then you would incur a $1 million tax. And if you couldn't pay the tax, which you probably couldn't, they'd throw you in prison. See, the tax does not depend on being able to pay it, or a criminal liability for not paying it. It is always assumed that you have the ability to pay any tax. So, being able to tax people for not doing things means that Congress can make you do absolutely anything. And even if it is politically uh, infeasible to try to uh, adopt a tax at the congressional level, now we have a precedent that the states can seize on. All of a sudden, state legislators can look at this precedent and say, aha, it's okay for the feds to impose a tax on not doing something. We, we have a revenue shortfall. Let's just start taxing not doing things. And even if the Health Care Act is repealed, the precedent is still on the books, and the states are still taxing not doing things. So I've had this argument with several of my friends, including Andy Randy Barnett, who was lead counsel in uh, this, these cases. He doesn't think that it's a serious threat because he doesn't think that Congress is going to be willing to impose any more taxes. But I don't think he's thought through uh, how bad it could get down the line. So this could be one of the worst decisions uh, since Wickard will be Filbert. Now, that takes us then to the subject of my email today. The argument, the, the, that, that was the main kind of argument, whether we should comply strictly or not. But then there's another common thread that even if we decide that we sh want to comply strictly, that uh, it would cause too much disruption. That there are too many people who uh, now rely on violations of the Constitution, and it would uh, uh, cause too much injury, too much damage, if we were to now go back and comply strictly with the Constitution. Um, these, these, those who have become dependent on violation are what are sometimes called reliance interests. And this is a term you will see in court decisions. Uh, and it is a factor in all of this. It's basically political rather than legal, but nevertheless, court decisions are being made on that basis. 
So uh, it then takes us to the problem, which was in my email today. Is the Constitution defective because it demands more of us than we have it in us to, to do? Uh, is it somehow inconsistent with human nature as it actually is? Are we naturally incapable? Are we naturally inadequate for the demands of a written Constitution of Government? in particular ours. And our, and the reason why in the title I say, is it fit for Americans, is because I hold open the possibility that it might be fit for somebody else. Or that it might have been fit for Americans in the early Republic period, but no longer is. Uh, this, come, this argument arose recently in a uh, forum in which I'm involved in, and uh, it, it, it ra does raise an interesting question because it is contrary to natural law to have uh, laws, governmental laws, that are contrary to human nature. Uh, you don't want to try to make or enforce laws that uh, just go against what it is that human beings naturally tend to want to do. However, it did seem to work in this country for at least the period from 1800 to 1824, the so-called Jeffersonian era. Uh, similar constitutions have been working in some countries, some for quite a long time, uh, especially Northern European countries, where the constitutions are taken fairly seriously. Now, on the other hand, there are some countries where they don't work very well at all. Uh, I was once visited in Sacramento when I was living there by a uh, tour group uh, being ushered by the U.S. State Department of the top jurists, essentially Supreme Court justices, of about uh, 30 countries. So we had about 50 guys there. And uh, they had deliberately asked the State Department to, have to hear me. So the, the, the state was not too happy about that, but they flew them all the way to Sacramento just to listen to me talk, which I found kind of interesting and from a variety of viewpoint. These guys didn't have too much to say. Their questions weren't that deep. But I had a pretty good idea what they would be, so I went ahead and Anne tried to answer them in the lecture I gave. But one of them did volunteer that when he went to find a copy of his own country's constitution so he could decide a case, the only place he could find it was on our, my website. And I've gotten that from a lot of students in some of these countries. Their libraries don't have copies of their own country's constitutions. Their law libraries, such as they are, don't have copies. They've been written once, maybe tucked away somewhere, and nobody looks at them again. So, constitutions have a very different status depending on the country and its civic culture. Uh, and our founders were very sensitive to this. We have all kinds of founding quotes to the effect that the Constitution is designed for a virtuous people. That if the people ever cease to be virtuous, it will fail. So the founders saw civic virtue as a variable. They didn't see it as a constant like human nature. Human nature may evolve slowly over a period of time. There is reason to think that in the last 30,000 years we've gotten somewhat smarter. Probably better looking. Probably healthier. But we haven't changed very much. Because we can see that 
if the humanity diverged about 50,000 years ago, and the differences between uh, Africans, Europeans, Asians, and Australians is fairly small. But there are some differences. Um, and we can imagine that, so therefore the human nature had changed a little bit, but it only provides a bound on civic virtue. Uh, human, civic virtue varies within fairly wide limits. It may not reach superhuman human levels, and of course it can reach abysmal levels, the lower limit is pretty bad. But generally speaking, human beings most of the time are going to fall within a certain range. And there are conditions that affect what that is, from person to person, from individual to individual, group to group, nation to nation, and time to time. Now, the first question that we need to examine is what are the demands of the Constitution? And let's draw a graph here. A little hard to draw a straight line, but you get the idea. And here's our this is where this represents number of people, and this represents what well, let us call it virtue. Now, virtue is really a very multidimensional metric. It combines talent and virtue, uh, but it's inconvenient to, to try to represent you know, hundreds or thousands of dimensions on a single whiteboard, so I'll reduce it to one value. Uh, but if we could see it in multiple dimensions, you'd get a, a more better realization of our situation. Okay, and generally speaking, the distribution of virtue in a population is going to be a Gaussoid curve. Kind of like this. Also sometimes called a bell, bell curve. Now, this peak is called the node. Or mode, sorry. And there's also a value median, which is the point at which half of the area under the curve is on either side of it. In this particular one that I've just drawn, the mode and the median should be about the same, but in general they'll tend to differ a little bit. And of course they may also be close to the mean or average. Now, in fact, for most of the things that we would call talent or virtue, this is a reasonably good approximation. But what is it that a constitution requires of us? Well, I, would, I think we have to admit that the founders, when they wrote the constitution, had in mind a distribution that looks sort of like this. Oops. Yeah, let's see if I can. This may not show up on the video, but. So, if, as some contend, the demands on the people are somewhat higher than the distribution at some point, then they would fall short and constitutional compliance wouldn't work. Now, of course, the founders themselves would claim 
that the distribution they had in mind was somewhat closer to this. So the virtue would fall on well outside of it, and it should be workable under most circumstances. Um, different people's models of human beings and human nature and government uh, have different concepts about this. The, in a country with rule by an aristocracy, the aristocracy is going to tend to think that the distribution of virtue looks like this. That a few people have most of the virtue, and that the majority of people uh, lack it, and therefore democracy won't work. Where this works out, the, the way this works out in practice, though, it gets much more complicated. The American Revolution was fought with about 3% of the population as active participants. They had this moral and financial support of about a third of the population. They had the opposition of, a, of another third. But that third who was opposed, the, ro the loyalists, royalists, or uh, Tories, were in general not organized or focused. Some of them did participate in militia under British command, but for the most part, they uh, were not very active. So the third that were active were the ones who elected our four founding fathers as their leaders. And they're the ones who carried the revolution and later on uh, established the Constitution. And of course, a lot of the Tories left the country. Now, looking at various models of uh, the needs of government and of the, need, the abilities of the people, uh, during the English Civil War uh, from uh, uh, 645 to 649, uh, when Cromwell gained ascendancy for a period of time, uh, a royalist is quoted to have said, a commonwealth is not fit for the people because the people are not fit for a commonwealth. And that was the prevailing view among uh, monarchists and aristocrats of most countries at that time. They looked upon the mass of the people and they saw ignorant savages. People were, couldn't possibly be trusted to make decisions about government. Of course, they weren't necessarily much better, but at least they were in charge and could imagine that they were adequate. So, when this country was founded, it posited the entire subject on a new model with its own vision of human capabilities. The problem is that whereas persons, human virtue might have been good in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, over a period of time, it might be inclined to, to, to decline. And become less and less adequate. So, we've also seen, William James wrote about it in an essay called The Moral Equivalent of War. He noted that civic virtues seem to increase during periods of warfare, during the wars, and to decline during the periods between wars. Of course, he couldn't be in favor of war as a way of inculcating civic virtue, so he, in his essay, he tried to find an alternative to war that could increase civic virtue. Well, I don't think he found any good, really good alternatives, but at least he was trying. But his, the observation is basically sound that this points out 
the basic problem, as Ronald Reagan said in the speech, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. Civic virtue starts out with each new generation at about this point. Infants. It only increases through education and, in, and induction into the social contract by parents, teachers, and the society. It starts out here, it gets to here, perhaps here, perhaps to here. But it may not make it. So if we're not doing our part to move it, to change its shape as the children age and become adults, uh, eventually the whole thing falls apart. We also have the problem that whereas the in the founding era, the royalists were only a third, but they were disorganized. In today's world, they are organized. Now they are the one-third to one-half of the population that receives government benefits. Either salaries, you know, contract payments, uh, pensions, uh, entitlement, uh, benefits or whatever. So we have, it's estimated that about half the population are tax getters and the other half are taxpayers, consumers or producers. And we have therefore a situation where it is not just that not enough people fall to the right of the performance curve, it is that there's a bunch that are actively resistant. Those are what we call the reliance interests. And it's going to be very difficult, even if we were to move the performance curve of the population well ahead of the demands of the Constitution, to get a, away from the problem that we have a performance curve of, that's bimodal, to be represented down here to avoid fluttering the diagram, we have tax getters and tax payers. And these guys are fighting these guys. And of course, we see that playing out in our political processes. I think that the, one of the main explanations for our current polarization is precisely this bimodal bifurcation of the performance curve of the American population. It was used prior to World War II and until about the mid 60s, I'd say it still looked was being unimodal, looking more like that. But I think we're beginning to see a split. And uh, if we are, then that bodes very ill for our future. Uh, because we do not really know what to do with these guys, other than cutting them loose and having them suffer the consequences of being cut off. And one of the main reasons why they get those subsidies is to keep them from becoming violent. But what is often unspoken in the halls of power is that the subsidies to the poor is not really uh, just to raise them out of poverty, it's to keep them from turning to crime. And we already see in some of our inner cities levels of crime that amounts to de facto civil war. It's not just in Mexico that we see criminal gangs becoming one side of a, what amounts to a civil war. We see that in our inner cities. And of course, they're often the same gangs. 
branches of the same gangs. Uh, when people can no longer make a living in an economy that provides jobs that match their skills, and skills are bifurcating like this too. Uh, when my grandfather taught public school in the, from 1899 to 1935, less than a third of the students graduated from high school, or needed to. Most people went into uns unskilled jobs. But during that time frame, since then, we've seen the mechanization of agriculture, of mining, of manufacturing, of distribution, and even now of white collar jobs. As a computer programmer, I've contributed to that. I estimate I've probably eliminated maybe at least 80,000 jobs for the software I've written, and probably created 20,000. But the different jobs for different skill sets of different people. And we're creating a vast pool of unemployable people. I've said that the good news is all those jobs that are being offshored are coming back. The bad news is that when they do, they'll be done by robots. So we are faced with another kind of fundamental kind of problem, how to distribute the product of society when most people are no longer able to, to contribute to production. Um, this is an unprecedented situation in human history. So there are a lot of complicating factors that make it difficult to apply some of the rules and principles that we've gotten used to, like the free market as we've understood it. Uh, the free market still is better than most all the alternatives, but the real fact is that uh, the free market can also lead to extinction. There's nothing about the invisible hand that uh, guarantees that there'll be any of us left after it moves, after it writes its lines. Um, so we do have some fundamental problems. Of course, now we have the bubbles. We have a kind of super bubble, most of it based upon fiat currency. Um, as I've explained before in previous uh, lectures, uh, the, we seem to be divided between three major groups of leaders. Uh, the, the, some, mostly the Democratic Party, think that we have at least 20 years and that we can somehow grow ourselves out of the crisis. The Republicans, the conservative, fiscally conservative Republicans, think we might have between five and ten years, and that we can uh, grow ourselves out of it, at least partly, by cutting benefits and cutting taxes. And then there are some of us who have been saying it for a long time that we don't have that much time, especially now. We may only have two years. There's nothing that can be done in two years in terms of public policy except to pave the way for the recovery. So much of what I'm trying to do in my efforts is to lay the foundation for getting past the crisis and to the other side. And hopefully that won't leave us with a fascist dictatorship that will obviate all other reforms that we might contemplate. So, we have, uh, of course, also the problem of how do we get to the point where Americans are adequate to comply with the Constitution and with its demands. Contrary to what a lot of people think, the Constitution is not something that can be understood as it was originally meant by someone with only a fifth grade education. In fact, even a high school education is inadequate. Even a college education, even a law school education. Almost no lawyers 
really have the skills that it takes to understand the Constitution. I've been at it for 60 years, and I'm still learning things. The Constitution of 1787 is written in the legal English of 1787. It is not the legal English that lawyers use today. It's a different language. During this period of time, the English language has been evolving. The language of 1787 is about midway between the language of today and the language of Queen Elizabeth's time, Shakespeare. Most people, when they read a Shakespeare play, need to refer to footnotes, because most of it is not going to make much sense to them. It may seem to, especially if it's read aloud, if it's performed on stage, but if you read it as a written document, a lot of it isn't just isn't going to make sense to you. And it's not just because it's written in a dramatic style of, that Shakespeare used. It really is a different language. And if you go back to the time of Simon de Montfort, the first great uh, Whig or liberal reformer in 1265, he wrote the very first written constitution for England the so-called Provisions of Oxford. Now those were overturned after he lost the Battle of Evesham in 1265, later that year. But we can imagine that if he had won the Battle of Evesham, there would have been no need for the American Revolution, because the revolution would have happened in 1265. The, the line of reforms that he was beginning to build were, would have put us on a very fast track, I think, to where, where we are today, except we would have gotten here several hundred years sooner. We not, might already have colonies on, around other stars. We might have settled Mars in the 1700s. So, one battle can make a huge difference in history, and I find that one battle to be such a severe reversal in, the pro in human progress that uh, it's hard for people today to appreciate how much we lost that day. But the key point, of course, is that human progress is not necessarily a steady march toward improvement. It can take steps back as well, very long steps. Civilizations not just rise, don't just rise, they also fall. We, Toynbee has examined 21 great civilizations in history, of which we're the last, and every one of them fell except ours, and we, we're still waiting on ours. Uh, civilizations do fall. There are reasons why they fall. In general, because they encounter a challenge that they are inadequate to meet. Challenges also cause civilizations to arise. Moderate challenges, slow challenges that people have time to respond to and to develop the talents and virtues that they need to meet them. But if you get a sudden unexpected challenge that's too great, history has shown that human beings generally fail to rise to them. A few individuals might, but they tend not to be enough to overcome the mass of people who are not adequate. So if we have to ask, answer the question, is the Constitution fit for Americans, the answer is marginal. Americans at their best, and as they can be, are adequate, but just barely. <coughs> this is a very, uh, it's like designing a space shuttle or uh, many other examples of modern engineering. They're designed right up to the limits of what can work. 
if any of you know anything about helicopters, for example, you know that they are at their design limit in most cases. Uh, it only takes a few things going wrong and the bird comes down. And a helicopter typically spends 40% or more of his time in the shop. So, uh, many, many modern instruments, computers for example, have gotten fairly reliable, but even they are in many cases operating right up against their design limits. They're pushing it all the time. Driving a car is something that most people can learn how to do, but some can't. And most of us cannot handle certain driving situations that may develop. Emergencies for which we're not prepared. Um, so for, all, for most of the common activities that we engage in every day, there are demands upon those who would perform in that situation, and there are talents and virtues that we bring to bear uh, to, to, for, to, in order to meet that performance demand, and we either succeed or we don't, but we are have increasingly uh, a system in which, for almost m most of our systems, we are pushing the limits. If we do everything right, we work very hard, we can succeed. But a single mistake, a single slacking, a single inattention to detail, and the whole thing can come crashing down. The financial markets are, have become an example of that. Uh, the algorithms used for in hedge funds and derivatives were designed to almost never fail. And as we've seen, they almost always do eventually fail. So there was a design for use by single players for limited periods of time. And of course, if they can cash out in that period of time, great. But in the long run, the outlook is dismal. Uh, so the, yes, the answer is yes. The Constitution is, that, is fit for us if we do our part. And that, of course, is the reason why we're met here today. Because you now are charged with the responsibility of turning this country around. Don't look for anyone else to do it. Don't send a letter to Congress saying, do something about this, unless you can tell them what to do. And I've tried to provide the answers to that, the details. I have bills I've written, I've proposed litigation, I have all kinds of details. But it requires a lot of work to read all this stuff. And then of course even more work to send it, to make copies and send letters to your congressman or to candidates and saying support this. Now you don't have to understand what you're sending completely. It, it represents years of work. You don't have to expect the official to understand it. He probably won't. Very few members of Congress understand their, legis their, their legislation. They rely on their staffers and their long lobbyists to advise them this is a good thing, vote for it. For the most part, most of them are totally overwhelmed. So, if you want to know who is in charge, well, the simple answer is no one is in charge. No one can be in charge. We are in, the world is in a situation in which it is, events are unmanageable. Except in a, in a very marginal way. So if we do everything we can to do our best, we may just barely be good enough. But we also need to be very, very lucky. So I'll break it at this point and uh, open the floor for questions. You just
describe the derivative sparkage a little bit better? Okay. Well, let's explain how they came into being. When I was in an investor many years ago, if you wanted to build a house or an apartment project or a shopping mall or a factory or any number of things, you had basically one of two ways to finance it. You could either go to a lender and borrow the money, or you could issue stock, which is essentially a way of borrowing money from the investors. Um, it just takes a somewhat different form. Now, if you look, borrow money from a, a lending institution, then the question is, where does a lending institution, institution get its money? Well, if it's a depositor, depository institution, it has customers with bank accounts who deposit money. It, have, it holds that money for them, and if they ask for it back, it gives it but to, to them back. But way back in the 19th century, banks started figuring out, well, the chances are everybody's not going to ask for their money at the same time. So while we've got it, let's loan it out. So then the, that was the institution of fractional reserve banking. After a while it became necessary to, or thought necessary, to regulate the amount of money that a bank had to keep in reserve to cover uh, withdrawals. But then it could otherwise loan out other people's money. And the argument made to the depositors was, well, uh, you're, you're going to keep your money in the bank account most of the time anyway, right? And uh, by letting us loan out your money, we don't have to charge you for keeping your account. So instead of charging you a fee to keep your money, uh, we can give you a free checking account. Or maybe even pay you interest on it. Uh, and that was attractive to most people, so uh, that most people bought into it. Now, take it a next step further, uh, now that they've loaned out the money, they've got a note. Well, what do they do with that note? Well, they can simply collect it. Uh, they can uh, receive payments from the borrower, uh, monthly payments perhaps, for 30 years, and of course charge, they charge interest on that. So over a period of time, they might get the money back with a certain amount added to it, the interest. But this is a fairly slow way of getting your money back and of making money on it. So along the way, a lot of people, not, initially not so much banks as other kinds of lenders, discovered they could make more money by selling their notes, usually at a discount, let's say 50%, and with the money they got from selling them, now that somebody else had to collect them, they could take that money and invest it in something else. And then do it again and again and again. Um, so there became a market in commercial paper, in debt instruments. And after a while, it was no longer feasible to try to find a single buyer for your notes. So instead of a single buyer, you bundle a bunch of notes together and create a bond. In other words, a kind of another note, but it's where you are borrowing money from some of somebody and using all these other notes as collateral. This is a derivative. And you can have bonds bundled together to make more derivatives and bundled together to make more derivatives and so forth. Until after a while the connection between the original loan, which might be collateralized by a house, is a long way from this bond, this security, that may now be traded worldwide by people who don't have a clue 
what is back by. So this was the process called securitization, by which all these ordinary notes, the debt instruments, became bundles of bundles of bundles of bundles of debt instruments, and they started being, being speculated upon. So that now people were, lenders were making money, not on the interest from people paying back the loans, but from selling or bundling, securitizing the notes themselves. They made more money doing that than in collecting on them. Well, obviously, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that can't go on, because what that is, is inherently a speculative bubble. If it becomes untethered from real value, then eventually, if, it ever, if, if it's the growth of it ever falters, like any Ponzi scheme, the whole thing comes crashing down. So what you have is a financial system that is essentially one big complicated array of Ponzi schemes. And that includes all, almost all national currencies. This Federal Reserve note, up until 1971, was at least backed by gold in international transactions. They went off gold in 1933 for personal transactions, but until 1971 and a, a House Joint Resolution 192, uh, they at least for international transactions you could get gold for this. After that, it came back only by, and it says here, Federal Reserve note, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. And what is it backed by? Well, it's not backed by anything, is it? Only the full faith and credit of the United States, whatever that is. Well, all that is, is a nebulous promise not to print too many of these. Not to increase the money supply too fast. But, if the government gets into trouble, it will inevitably under, be under irresistible pressures to expand the money supply. It faced that problem not twice now, within the last couple of years, the, the result was what they call quantitative easing. The two rounds, quantitative easing one and quantitative easing two, QE1, QE2. Now what was that was done, that was done not to bail out ordinary people, but to bail out the financial institutions, including foreign banks. In effect, it provided them with liquidity by increasing the supply of dollars, which are now the world's reserve currency. All the other countries' currencies are backed by the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar is, of course, backed by full faith and credit of the United States. Uh, what that effectively did was head off a deflationary collapse of the world's currencies and the world's financial institutions. So it inflated the currency, but only within the financial sector, initially. Now eventually, the financial sector is going to start buying things with that money. Real estate, petroleum, uh, all kinds of investments. Uh, and what well, it does, the increase in the money supply is going to diffuse out into the general economy. So it's very likely that the seeds for hyperinflation have already been planted and are probably already irreversible. And another round, QE3, will almost certainly trigger that hyperinflation, which is generally defined by inflation of at least 20% per month. At that point, uh, 
even if the banks are still open, you can go to the bank and get money that's not worth anything. You can drain your bank account and only be able to get a loaf of bread, maybe. You won't be able to pay your utility bills. You won't be able to pay your, uh, you know, ordinary expenses, food, water, you know. Uh, rent might not increase as fast, but eventually the, your landlord or your mortgager is going to go under too. Now the good news there is that if it's a mortgage, chances are you'll never have to pay it off because there won't be anybody to pay to. What do you mean? Well, there may be a mortgage on your house and, you know, you go to pay your, mor your, your mortgage payment and there's nobody to pay it to. There are a lot of business. The mortgage company that you got the loan from that well, we'll went under? Or? Yep. There are a lot of people who have been losing their homes because they made all the payments uh, to a servicing agency who did not pass on the payments to the owner and holder of the note and then went bankrupt, leaving the, the, the hapless owner, owner, the mortgagee, with an unsecured claim against the servicing company and in default and therefore in foreclosure. Don't find out about it until the, the, the sheriff shows up one day and says, you're evicted, move out. So house, has been, house has been sold, you don't have a lease here anymore. Well, who, who gets the house, the guy that uh, got the original loan on the house, or uh, as you say, the, the sheriff? Never, you never know. They may not even be able to figure it out. A lot of the lenders have been shredding their original notes and therefore shredding the, the obligation, and yet they still have the mortgage. The, the note, the obligation has been extinguished, but the claim on the property still exists. So, so that claim is without substantiation. Yeah, but you may wind up spending more money on lawyers to prove it than the house is worth. So, uh, we are in a pretty bad situation. Uh, I recommend to people that they uh, have or get a friend with a good piece of farmland in the country with a good supply of water and uh, that's defensible because you may have the job of defending it in exchange for having something to eat. Now there'll be uh, a famous Mexican bandit once told a friend of mine that there will always be a place for a man with a gun. So would you say these things are being done by design? By the elite? Well, only, uh, only not in the sense that they des design the outcome. They are clue clueless as to what the, it all go becomes of it. They, it's, it's a design in the sense that they are, what they are doing is deliberate, but they are creating a situation for themselves that they do not understand and absolutely do not want, but they don't know what to do about it. Never get the impression that the people in charge know what they're doing. I spent two years in Washington getting to know a lot of these people members of Congress, uh, you know, the White House, the cabinet, uh, major leading banking institutions, great institutions of this country. They are mostly led by media, very mediocre people. Are there any simple maneuvers that the banks could do, like accounting maneuvers, to alleviate some of these uh, problems? No. Like Ron Paul had like a, seems like he, I remember he had like a three-year plan to balance the budget or something like that. Well, that would have been a good idea 30 years ago. And of course it doesn't hurt to try it now just to demonstrate that it can't work. But, uh, you know, there are a lot of things that, you know, in, at the, at the point if you're going over the cliff, you do just to, demonstrate to people that 
here is what we should have done. And if any of you survive after we hit the bottom, uh, you can know how to do avoid it next time. But no, we're going over. Where, where does the element of greed come into in terms of you know, you know the, the elite, you know, private international bankers, you know, whatever? I mean, do you think they're just they're just greedy and corrupt? Is that why they you know uh, our economy is so badly mismanaged? Well. There's an element of that, but it's mostly incompetence. Mostly incompetence. They don't deliberately set out to do evil things. Most of them, if you knew them socially, and I don't do know a lot of them socially, they're basically ordinary people like anyone else who think they know what they're doing and they don't. You know, they're like they're trying to do brain surgery with a jackhammer. That, you know, that's, <coughs> that they have created systems for themselves that is totally beyond the ability of any human beings to comprehend. Vastly beyond. They would need to have IQs of 10,000, 100,000, a million. There's no way they can cope with it. So you're just saying they're just misguided? Thoroughly. Did you say? Thoroughly. They, they bet that they knew what they were doing and they didn't. Just like a guy who goes to the, to the uh, casino in Las Vegas and he thinks he's got a system and he bets using the system and loses everything because of, guess what, the system doesn't work. Everybody, they all think they've got a system for beating the odds, and they don't. I haven't heard from you, much from you, young man. What, what are your thoughts on the aftermath? Everything collapses, then what? Well, then, hopefully, we'll have learned the right lessons. Now, a lot of people, a lot of that one-third or one-half, are going to be calling on government to save them. They're going to be looking for a man on a white horse, a typically a dictator. And we may get a dictator for a while. But as we've seen in other countries that have gone through periods of dictatorship, that doesn't work either. So the dictator doesn't even know any more, more what to do than a democratically elected leader does. Do you think that's what Obama is? in a sense of, you know, he, what he's done and how he was elected and the people who supported him? Uh, no, I think Obama is pretty much what he seems to be, which again is just another clueless guy. Yeah. He's not evil. Now he might turn out to do evil things, as any of them might, but not intentionally with that intention in mind. Uh, Never attribute to malice what can be explained by incompetence. <laughs> okay. I gotta write that one down. <laughs> That's an old saying. Okay, any more questions? I've got one for you. I just happened to pick up the same uh, folio where I made some notes uh, earlier. We are talking about uh, maybe take a little different angle on the degree thing. I've got a note here that uh, you mentioned the uh, United States was recovering from the stocks loss of 1929, which the stocks and the losses were out and out in greed. Yeah. And then along came the Austrian bank collapse in 1931, yeah. which involves banks. Mm -hmm. Specifically, the Rothschilds. Yeah. And that collapse took down the international monetary system. Exactly. That's that was, that's the, no that was the, the real cause of the Depression. How would you relate that to what's going on now? Yeah, very similar. But in 1931, the, there were a few banks positioned that they triggered a domino effect. 
Today we have, we don't have it so much centralized in a few institutions. Now we've got almost all of them ready to go. Uh, in every country. So the situation is in many ways much worse. Because we're just waiting for the first one to go. No, no one of them is necessarily the, the one that can trigger it. Any of them can do it. In fact, we're probably, once it starts happening, it can happen very quickly. That, that would be my next thought, is we have so many of them right on the verge that there won't be any domino effect. It will be more like an implosion. Yeah. So yeah, it's like a, that would also it, it's like that. blowing flour in a room and then lighting a match to it. Could you comment on the fames uh, those years of uh, 1999, 2000, when they had supposedly uh, balanced the federal budget and brought the national debt to zero? And you have to, you know, I mean, of course, during the 90s, there was a multi trillion dollar debt load in there, and how it, how it all of a sudden just uh, happened to mysteriously, uh, you know, uh, get uh, the, uh, the uh, the debt just happened to go to zero? No, the debt never went to zero. Yeah. Well, that's the, the, the deficit was greatly reduced. Yeah. Uh, the reason for that was the dot com bubble, the tech bubble of the 80s. 90s. 80s and 90s. Right. Um, that was generating a lot of revenue from taxes. But it was a false growth because it was unsustainable. What you had was a lot of tech companies were, that were betting that they could make billions on selling ads over the internet. Basically, it was all based upon marketing models. The simple fact is that, as any of them should have been able to realize, as I tried to point out to them, there's simply not enough advertising revenue to sustain all of those models. In fact, it's even worse, even worse than that because it's inherent in internet marketing that the advertiser can know almost immediately how effective the ads are. You can count the clicks. You know how many sales results, you know, for, you know, on the average from each clip. You don't have to spend a lot of money on radio and television and magazines and other media, which you generally do without having any idea how effective they're going to be. They may broadly affect your sales figures, you know, a year or two's hence, but you usually never know exactly what's working. With internet marketing, web marketing, you generally do know, which means that you know not to put a lot of money into it. It's very quick, easy to quickly determine that you can only usefully spend so much money on marketing, and beyond that it's just a waste. So you don't spend that much money on marketing. And everybody else makes has the same realization. Therefore, the amount of money available for marketing is much smaller. The, the, the dot-com uh, era was based upon the premise that they were going to be able to scarf in all that money that was going to radio and TV and magazines and newspapers. That somehow they could grab all that. Well, first of all, there was already a decline in those fields, but uh, the simple fact is that there was not. And even the ones who realized that this was unsustainable said, well, maybe it's unsustainable for everybody else, but maybe we can beat the odds. Well, in fact, some of them did beat the odds, Google. But it's almost unique. I mean, Yahoo is not making it. Uh, Facebook is yet to show a profit. Uh, you know, a lot of the other uh, web marketing systems that we've been tried, Group Groupon is not making it. Okay, you, you go down the list and Google has essentially sucked up all the air out of the room. 
We also have things like Microsoft has pulled out of its MSNBC joint venture. Yeah. So it's a, uh, and of course Google's model is itself is unsustainable because it is so dominant that it is affecting the culture. Uh, of course, we have Google ads on our website, but I can already see a pattern emerging. People are clicking on ads, not because they're really interested in what's being advertised in purchasing it. They're interested in either rewarding the advertiser, just because they like him or they like the fact that he's supporting a website that they like, or punishing him because they, they want to spend his money uselessly. So for example, uh, all these political ads. You know, I've heard several conversations now that, uh, to the effect, you know, if you are against Dewhurst, you click on Dewhurst ads to make him spend his money uselessly. You're not going to vote for him anyway. A lot of people are clicking on Obama ads because they want him to waste his money. Uh, That's a perverted way of using the law of unintended consequences. Yeah, because it's what we call would you, would you be for strategic <laughs> clicking. It's clicking for reasons other than interest in buying the product. Uh -huh. Would you be for equalized campaign funding for all, like, you know, like two of the major party candidates? No, and say, like, absolutely not. That's just would just be another form of corruption. Could you discuss how uh, any of this uh, relates to uh, the overvaluation in the real estate market of uh, uh, the real estate market bubble? Yeah. In the last ten years, cheap money caused real estate values to rise beyond what is sustainable. Now, I was a real estate investor back in the fifties and sixties. We've operated according to certain rules. One of those rules was that you don't purchase something at a price that you could not rent it at, you know, and make money. So if you purchase something and figure what the mortgage payments are, you'd be able to make the mortgage payments and pay taxes and insurance and, and other, you know, and other fees and rent it at prevailing market rates and still make a decent profit. And you mean it had to pay its own way? It had to pay its own way. Wow, what a concept. And the amount you could expect people to pay in rent was one-fourth of their income. No one should pay about more than one-fourth of their income for housing. That was it. Ancient rule goes back more than a hundred years. Well, all of that went by the wayside. People started buying houses and making mortgage payments that were higher than they would pay in rent for the same house. So, we got into a situation where in my opinion, the price of houses, now these are newer houses, they doesn't necessarily apply as to older And this is something you can ones. see coming, right? Yeah, I, mean, I, I saw you, it coming. You can see that it was you know, sure. right, uh, overvalued. Well, I'd say right in particular overvalued price. by about a factor of four. Yeah. A house that sells for 400000 should really be selling for 100000 But here's where it gets <laughs> interesting because not only with the the uh, mortgages be underwater, as expression goes, the balance greater than the value of the property, if the property were more accurately valued, but it is below replacement cost. So that $400,000 house might actually cost 200000 to build, even though the market value is only 100000 so even if the lender takes it back, he has something that is worth less than he's got in it. But he still has taxes to pay on 400000 
At that point, the only rational course for him to take is to tear it down and only have to pay taxes on the empty lot. But now, all of a sudden, the community, the city, the state, the county, the uh, school district, are now have a tax base reduced by a factor of four, at least for those kinds of properties. And all of a sudden, they can't pay their bills. So they start laying off people. And I told the folks at Google, in a recent telephone conversation, you guys really ought to be considering relocating to Texas, because sooner or later, you're not going to have police and fire protection in Mountain View. Is that in California? Yeah. San it's in the lower peninsula, south of San Francisco. Uh, what, what role did uh, uh, banks' lending practices uh, play in that? There well, are... mostly because they could not compete unless they engaged in securitization. They couldn't get enough money to loan out in order to make money on the lending unless they sold their, their notes, unless they securitized. So once some, some of them started securitizing, they almost all had to. And once they all had to, it created a, an un, this unsustainable rush, this essentially a bubble, uh, with, that can only end one way. There was nobody to say no. There was nobody to look at the overall situation and say, stop, don't do that. Because anybody who tried to do that would have been very unpopular. Was this not brought up by policy in the 70s of the uh, CRA and the uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's lobbying to change uh, lending practices? Yeah, that was part of it. All these things were factors. But most, almost all of them were driven by competitive pressures and speculative pressures. Once the speculative rush sets in, it becomes almost impossible for people not to participate and even stay in business. They'll be driven out of business if they don't join the, join the herd. But you have government policies being put in place to incentivize behaviors in the financial markets. Yeah, but that was all. Those policies were also driven by the institutions themselves. One thing, right? Our problems. The initiative didn't really come from government, or at least partly it did. I mean, they had the idea that everybody should own his own home. Well, that's actually a good idea, but not a big home, not a McMansion. <laughs> But everybody should own is like a mobile home. Oh wait, but if we go back to the fundamentals of what they can afford, uh, does that not call instantly into question what I seem to have gotten served up? That there's piece after piece after piece of video unavoidable proof that the government responding to institutional pressures went back against the institutional people to get them to relax their lending. Mm -hmm. So it was that was like throwing gasoline on the fire. Yep. But what you're which, saying, which caused them to want to get more gasoline to throw on the fire. But what you're saying is actually once that flow began, once the speculation flow began, the what we've been served up as reminders of the political intervention, while visible and distasteful, was nowhere near the power of the speculative rush. Yeah. Of course, the speculation affected the government as well. Well, then they just feed on each other. Yeah. You know, the, the government was spending money in a speculative mindset as well. That's how we got Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. That's how we got all these pension plans and, you know, uh, farm subsidies and other kinds of things. Yeah, 
they're all based on a, on a kind of speculative level. There's speculation in the private public sector as well as the private sector. Would you say that if the government had been adhering to the constitutional limits on federal you know, scope and authority of the federal government, that these problems could have been avoided? Most of them could have been, uh, not all of them. Uh, the Constitution doesn't really provide machinery for dealing with all of them. Uh, I have tried to find ways it could. For example, I've developed legislation using the bankruptcy power to break up large organizations. It's, there is not power, in my view, under the Commerce and Necessary Property Clauses, but under the, the, broad, the bankruptcy power is actually quite broad. It doesn't re really require that you wait until a, an organization becomes insolvent. If you expect it to become insolvent because it's too large to fail, it's reasonable to step in and break it up into smaller pieces that are less likely to have catastrophic consequences on the economy when they go down. So would you say that the Founding Fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, that they failed to foresee a day when we would have, for example, a uh, uh, you know, private, for-profit entity, uh, you know, along with the debt, uh, with the, uh, with the debt, uh, you know, Federal Reserve, uh, along with the debt-based economy? Well, yeah. They failed to account for that? Well, they did foresee the problem with debt-based currency. There had been previous experience with that. A guy named John Law, a, a Scotsman, invented debt-based currency. And he generated, actually, two speculative bubbles. One in the Mississippi Basin and one in the South Seas. And before that, there had been a speculative bubble in tulips, of all things. Uh, so these were things that involved even the king of France lost money on that deal. And the founders had the example of that experience, a uh, few of which have even lived in that period, and only occurred in mainly the early 1700s. So the memory of it was fresh, and that's why they required states not make anything but gold and silver coin legal tender. And it didn't really occur to them to say that the federal government shall not have authority to make anything legal tender on state territory, which they covered by simply omitting it, but that hasn't been enough to prevent it from being done. Now, the legal tender statute does not actually say legal tender on state territory. It just says shall be legal tender, like on the Federal Reserve note, I read from you. Now, constitutionally, that should only be on federal territory, like the District of Columbia. It's people glom on to that and say, oh, it must be legal tender everywhere, because it doesn't exclude the state territories. But that's not constitutionally correct. This is what I meant earlier about learning how to comply with the Constitution. The fact that I'm having to explain these things to educated people today, including lawyers, means that uh, they're not obvious. They were sort of obvious to the founders. They were in a hurry in 1787 when they wrote the Constitution. They couldn't think of everything. They did a remarkably good job of covering most things or at least providing us the tools that we could deal with them. But uh, I do fault Matt, both Madison and Jefferson for not having written treatises. Uh, they relied on other people to write the treatises, and those other people were not as good at it as they would have been. They should have sat, t taken the time, sat down, and written legal treatises explaining the Constitution and how to interpret it. Going over provision by provision and considering all the contingencies. 
That's what was really needed. But they were too busy doing other things, and of course they did have a lot of correspondence. They, they kind of re re remind me in a little way as of uh, myself and others today that are driven by email, by their inboxes. There were lots of correspondence, but the correspondence is not is sort of scattered. You couldn't pull it all together and come up with a single legal, legal treatise. And the few people who did write those legal treatises mostly took us in the wrong direction. So uh, the need for follow-up was there and it wasn't met. So now we have to do it for them, and, you know, 200 years later. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do. It may result in a book, or maybe more than one book, if I can ever find time to write it after trying to find ways to pay the bills. Uh, would you come, uh, comment on uh, Ron Paul's uh, uh, House Resolution uh, 459 to House the Federal Reserve? Yeah, again, it's something that would have been a good idea 20 or 30 years ago. It's a little late now. Now it's more of a gesture. There may not be a Federal Reserve by the time that it could be implemented. But they're both on, on one of my blogs, I found a uh, excellent cartoon showing an uh, airliner in a death, death dive and a conversation in the cockpit, you know, about, uh, you, know, uh, you know, we're going to crash and, uh, you know, the Obama administration offering to uh, do something trivial that obviously was not going to do any good. That's what everybody's doing. They're offering trivial things that they know won't work. So what major event of the last 10 years or so would you attribute mostly to the uh, economic collapse of the United States and uh, impending collapse? And I would offer uh, the costs associated with the Iraq war and all the debt created by uh, you know, the Iraq war and uh, having to care for uh, you know, veterans' uh, medical costs. Yeah, that's only a small, uh, that's a fairly small item, actually. It may seem like a lot, but the biggest mistakes were made in the 1937 time frame with the, with the New Deal. Everything else has been unfolding from that. Is that where you get the unfunded obligations from? Yeah. That's when most of it went wrong. Uh, we are now going to have to completely un undo the New Deal. In fact, we need to go all the way back to the court decision in McCullough v. Maryland in 1819 and overturn that. There are lots of things that need to be unwound. Do you think that, uh, as Ron Paul has stated, uh, that uh, the United States should shut down the military bases that it has in 130 some odd different countries and that would help? Well, in some cases, but as we've seen in shutting down military bases in this country, it doesn't necessarily save money. And what a lot of people don't realize about those foreign military bases is it's often cheaper to keep our troops there than to bring them back here. Now, of course, if you bring them back here and just discharge them, then you, you, yeah, you can save some money. But at the same force level, it is often, in fact, usually cheaper to keep them in other countries. In fact, a lot of those other countries subsidize our bases. Germany, for example, subsidizes our bases there. It's helping to pay for them. So our German bases are a good deal from our point of view. You also would have the unintended consequences of a whole lot of people needing something to do. Yeah, but also the unintended consequences that uh, we are, in fact, the policemen of the world. Ignoring that. Yeah. If we did not perform that function, nobody else would, and things could fall apart very quickly. I'm afraid we'd be well on our way to World War, world War III if that were to happen. And there's almost no way to predict how exactly it would happen. India and Pakistan might go at it, 
uh, Iran would develop nuclear weapons and it and Israel would go at it. Uh, you know, we, we're, we prevented a nuclear war between Russia and China. A lot of people don't know that. Uh, you remember the, uh, our ping pong team going to Beijing? Yeah, we, we, most people don't know the background of that. A few couple of years previously, the Chinese and the Russians were fighting. They essentially had a war going on along their, their border. And the Russians, you know, decided that, that they were going to nuke the Chinese. In fact, they had a particular nuke in mind. They called the super 300 megaton bomb. So large that it would wipe out entire regions, you know, like 300 miles across. Uh, but they had a problem because we had a policy called the nuclear umbrella, in which which held essentially that if the Soviet Union attacked any country with nuclear weapons, we will attack it. We put the entire planet under our protection except, of course, the Soviet Union itself and its allies. Now, it had been an ally with China, so at that time China was not under the nuclear umbrella. But when they had a falling out, it created an ambiguity. Was China now under our nuclear umbrella? So a low-level Russian diplomat, we might as well call them Russian, they are now, um, at a diplomatic reception in Moscow, approached his counterpart, an American uh, low-level diplomat, and asked him this question. Would the United States stand by if we launched a nuclear attack on China? Now, he was expecting the American to take this, you know, back to his supervisors and then study it for a few weeks and maybe get back to it. That's not what happened. The American immediately responded, no, we would most certainly not stand by. The Russian was pretty much taken aback. He wasn't expecting that answer. He said, well, shouldn't you go back and confer with your superiors about this? Yeah, I will, but I know what their answer is going to be. So, that got the Russians thinking. So, a few, few weeks later, a higher level Russian diplomat approaches a higher level American diplomat, same question, gets the same response. Of course, now this time the Americans are kind of expecting it, but... Finally, a very high Russian asks the same question of a very high American. And I can reveal now that high level Russian was Brezhnev and the high level American was Kissinger. Got the same response. The Russians called off their attack. The Chinese, through their spy network, found out about all this. And within a few days, they invited us to send our ping pong team to Beijing. And the rest is history. What year was that? 69. Oh. It's very difficult to remain an enemy with a country that just saved you from nuclear annihilation at the risk of their own annihilation. Very difficult to ignore that as a diplomatic move. So that was a case where by standing on principle, we may have saved the world from nuclear Armageddon. Because it almost certainly would not have been confined to those two countries. Um, but, and of course, U.S.-Chinese relations have been kind of moving along based upon that incident ever since. Uh, gradually improving, of course, with their ups and downs, but still basically friendly. Now, of course, most Chinese don't know this story. I've spoken to a few of them, and it's new to them. I was in a position to know, you know, I was in Washington, D.C., uh, almost at that time frame, a couple years later, from uh, 
essentially 1970 to 72 during the Nixon administration. And uh, so I knew a lot of the people involved in this. It was not a secret in Washington. Um, and that's also where I found out, by the way, that the Israelis had developed 20 nukes and they did it almost all by stealing nuclear materials from our, our nuclear power plants. What? The Israelis stole uh, your yeah. fission-based materials or whatever yeah. from us? Yeah, from our nu nuclear power plants, yeah. Is it possible enough, enough for 20 devices? Was complicit with that? Or what? Is it possible our government, uh, U.S. government was, was complicit with that? Or? No, we, we did nail one couple of their guys for doing it, but we didn't catch most of them. Yeah. And they still got nukes, right? Yeah. Of course, later on, they found their own sources of you know, uranium and all that, built their own, you know, pl plutonium reactors, but. Uh, Initially, that's how they got started. And they had to test them in South Africa, which meant that South Africa also acquired nuclear capabilities because they wouldn't let the Israelis test them there without sharing the technology with them. Of course, they got some technical support out of the deal, too. Um, anyway, that's how these things go. Um, you learn a lot when you're in Washington, D.C. The two years I spent there were was a real education. You can't learn what I learned by going to college or graduate school. So. So in 1970, and that's already 40 years ago. Yeah. It's stunning how relevant all of that still is. Yeah. Just for all of this change, it stays exactly the same. Yeah, except now we are in a, you know, futurists have different terms for future situations. And one of the big issues among futurists is a, an unmanageable future. And that seems to be what we're headed toward. Well, unmanageable, what, what do you mean, in terms of uh, the resources or? The no, in terms bad of management policies of the government. Governance. Not just our government governance, but private sector governance as well. So what you're seeing, the resources are there to you know provide for you know people. It's yeah. just the mismanagement of those resources that create the problems. Exactly. The material foundation for the economy is intact. Mm -hmm. Or we couldn't be meeting our needs now. But it, the, the way they're organized is extremely fragile. Uh, we're all on just-in-time inventory systems now. We count on being able to deliver uh, supplies to the production point at, uh, at the very day that they're needed. We don't stockpile anything. So there's no built-in buffers. Again, no supply housing. disruptions. No warehousing. Yeah. No inventory. So if the closest thing you've got to warehousing is your supermarket, and it would only take a couple of days for those shelves to be emptied. In fact, we saw we just saw that in the, the Midwest and West Virginia from that power failure. Within a couple of days, all the shelves were empty. So do you think it was disingenuous for John McCain in the 2008 election to uh, tout himself as a promoter of uh, green, uh, you know, green technologies or whatever? I uh, wouldn't tell. While in fact, what in fact, you know, from my own personal, you know, view from what I've seen is there, you know, you can have solar cells on your home where you can provide 90% of your electricity. But at the same time, what they've done is they've ruined the economy to where you know, a person who owns a house can't afford those solar cells, even if it just costs like fifteen thousand yeah. dollars or well, I'm just saying the prices are going down. Yeah. Uh, do you think it, it, it's, it's, it's just like 
where it was disingenuousness on John McCain's part to, to claim that he's for some green environmental technology while, in fact, people like John McCain have been, you know, working to promote these policies of economic, you know, uh, you know chaos and corruption. Well, McCain is just a follower. He doesn't understand any of this stuff. He's a nice old guy. But there was no way he was qualified to be president. I mean, he chose a vice presidential candidate who was better qualified than he was. Not just because she had more physical charisma. And we all have seen, saw that she wasn't at least very well prepared to answer reporters' questions. So uh, we had a dismal choice that year. And we're going to have another dismal choice this year. Because I don't think Romney is that hot either. And I certainly don't think Obama is. And none of these guys really know what they're doing. Uh, so, would, would, you, would you think it fair to say that enough of us are getting a clue that how bad the problem is and further getting a clue that you're getting wise to the fact that they really don't know. Yeah, and I have a lot of conversations just among people I meet casually, not just my usual suspects of, you know, people I communicate with regularly. Uh, I get out on a lot, I go to a lot of meetings, a lot of discussions, public events, you know, just talking to almost people on the streets. And yeah, we do have one thing that's new in human history. Never before in human history have so many people seen it coming. They don't know what to do about it. But this at least represents a kind of mental preparation. It won't come as a complete shock and hopefully that will translate into not turning to a man on a white horse. Hopefully. But it does need to, it does mean they're going to have to turn to something that can manage the catastrophe and get us through to the other side. And that's not going to be a, a, a charismatic leader, or at least not that there's anybody who can be that leader. Historically, though, everyone has always turned to the dictator. Yeah, historically, maybe we can be, can avoid that this time. For one thing, there is no obvious charismatic leader in sight. Yes. Yeah, well, you know, it's more difficult for one to emerge in today's environment. Did you uh, comment on the uh, movement uh, among a certain number of states, I think including uh, oh, uh, Oklahoma, maybe Texas, uh, to uh, declare nullify, uh, you know, uh, null and void the uh, uh, Obamacare, you know, nationalized health care? Uh, yeah, I'm in, I'm in contact with the sponsor of that legislation in Oklahoma, and he's clueless. It's a really bad bill. Mm -hmm. There's a really bad, good bill he could be pushing, and I presented it to him. He's just, apparently just glazing over. He gets it just, he just... It's, that, he just, do you think there would be uh, one way to like solve a lot of problems associated with the federal government? The states would uh, come out with their own legislation, and the federal government you know, oversets its bounds. Yeah. To uh, however, wherever the there's a way legislation to, is null and void. There's a way to do it and a way not to do it. The state cannot just declare federal actions null and void. Can't do it. It can't repeal what they do. All it can do is refuse to cooperate. And that will only work if the feds need the state's cooperation, which they do for some things and not for others. For the Health Care Act, they do not need the cooperation of the states at all. They don't. They can do everything from Washington. They don't have to send a single agent into the state. But what would you, how did the Tenth Amendment you know, apply to that? In terms of limiting the federal power. Well, it applies, states but right. it applies, but in a way that is not self-interpreting. 
the, self, the Tenth Amendment is obviously correct, but what it is simply saying that Congress shall not exercise power that has not been delegated to it. But it says, and all the legal establishment says, that all this power has been delegated to it. It says, we're not violating the Tenth Amendment. Everything we do is constitutional, because we say so. And the courts mm -hmm. say so. The courts have let us do absolutely anything. So we're, nothing that we're doing is violating the Tenth Amendment. So, you can't just hold up the Tenth Amendment and have expect everyone to understand what that means. They have to know what all the things are that are unconstitutional. And a very few people know how to interpret the Constitution. Are, are you, you're, I, mean, you're, I assume you're familiar with the, uh, the efforts of the Tenth Amendment Center? Yeah. I think uh, to uh, yeah. oppose Obamacare? Yeah, I work with them. Mm -hmm. They've got my proposal on their website. But it's not the one that they most prominently feature. And people are, they're basically just riding the wave. Whatever anybody feels like doing, they're letting them do it. That they're trying to avoid criticizing anything. And I don't hesitate, if, they're, if somebody's pushing a bad idea to say it's a bad idea, I'm sorry to rain on your parade, but that is a terrible idea. Here's a good idea. Right, forget forget exactly. this one. Does that mean you're standing on principle? Yeah, yeah something like oh, that. Okay. Yeah. Very unpopular. So it doesn't matter what the, you know, these feds, you know, it doesn't matter that in the Constitution, you know, that uh, it enumerates, you know, the third or can, cannot do, and there, there's nothing in there that talks about national health care because if there was something in there like that, we would have we already had that. Would you agree with that statement? Yeah, well, look. The McCullough decision in 1819 said the necessary and proper clause enables the government to do anything. Mm -hmm. Anything that's convenient. That was the big break. That's what has to be overturned. There were some who were hoping that this health care decision would do that. And of course the, uh, the reliance interests were panicked. They were afraid that there would be five votes to overturn the Health Care Act with an opinion that would effectively roll everything back all the way to McCullough. Well, they didn't do that. It should have. Do you think that uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, John Roberts, the guy that uh, cast the deciding vote uh, in favor of Obamacare, do you think he was doing it for political reasons to help Republicans get elected so they could overturn it uh, in, uh, next year? And they take off? No, I don't think so. I accept the reasoning that he put forward, and when we're learning about that reasoning from the leaks that have come out, he seemed to have been genuinely attached to the notion that judges are not supposed to overturn legislation if they can possibly avoid doing it. That's what's sometimes called judicial restraint. It's one of the tenets of one branch of conservative uh, judicial philosophy. Well, it doesn't have to be the one I support. I support strict adherence with the Constitution. And as the old Latin expression goes, mm -hmm. fiat justitia rua coelum. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. You don't worry about political consequences. You decide the law. And if the whole universe collapses as a result, too bad. So is it his opinion that you know, for Obamacare to be overturned, it needs to be overturned by you know, Congress? Yeah. But he didn't have to write the opinion that he did. That was made worse than the act itself, in my view. Yeah, because as you pointed out, now they can tax for not doing something. Yeah. Which means they have... Essentially, they have unlimited power. Unlimited power. Yeah. That is handed, unlimited power. To the now, I, I don't think Roberts understood or appreciated that that's what he was doing. Reading his opinion, my opinion of his, 
him as a legal scholar went way down. This is not a first-rate mind. He was touted as this, you know, really bright guy. I no longer think so. I think he's just a mediocre hack. You think he might be related to the Sith Overlord in Star Wars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that guy used to turn on limited power. Now that guy was even started working. That guy knew what he was doing. Yeah. Except that he was on the wrong side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The senator, the old Okay, I guess we can turn off the camera there. I think we're beginning to.